Hey everybody, it's Day and the Git School Dude once again with another Git tutorial video. Today we're going to be doing a little bit of Git stuff, but mostly we're going to be focusing on GitLab Continuous Integration, GitLab CI as it's known. Uh, GitLab CI is something I use at work. It's a very powerful way to continuously test and deploy your code and monitor apparently as well. And you can read on the, the GitLab webpage, gitlab.com, about uh, what it can do, the advantages of using it. Um, but today we're just going to basically give a quick introduction of what it is, how to set it up for a small project, and a couple of the caveats you might run into, and um, really just describing the best way to go about using continuous integration in your project. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. I'm going to flip over to a Hello World project that we have over in the Git School Dude gitlab.com namespace. Uh, feel free to go ahead and clone or fork or mess with the project however you want and explore it. Um, right now we're looking at a merge request one which was merged. Wow, 10 months months ago was my last Git, uh, GitLab video I guess. <laughs> and so we merged this uh, merge request meaning it's in the master branch. We did some work here. This was just an example to show what merge requests are. And I just wanted to show you what a merge request looks like without GitLab CI before we go ahead and add it because I want to show you the difference between using GitLab CI and not using GitLab CI. So what we've got here is an old merge request. You can see that it was merged. I'm pointing out this area because when, when you have GitLab CI enabled, you get a whole nother dashboard here that shows you the status of testing for the merge request in question. So let's go ahead and flip over to our terminal where we have the exact same hello world repo if I do a git status you can see I'm on the GitLab CI branch I've already made a branch where we introduce what what I call the GitLab CI YAML file which on disk is a hidden file with this name this is a special name that GitLab knows how to read and this file uh, defines the testing that will be performed for the project so I open up the file it looks like this you can see that we've defined two stages, a build run, a build stage and a run stage. Uh, we, here's a job named build code, which is associated with the build stage. And the script is the part which actually defines what we're going to do. Now in this project, we just do a simple make to build the project. And of course, we have one more test called nominal run. It fits in the run stage and its script execution is to just run dot slash hello. So just to remind you guys, in our project we hit make, what comes out is a hello binary, and you can run the hello binary in this way. And so it's a very simple hello world program that just sort of creates some classes and prints some stuff out, no big deal. Okay, so I've already pushed this branch, but let's just go ahead and do it again for completeness. If we were to take this branch, push it to origin so that that YAML file exists, it says everything's up to date because I already pushed it. Let's go ahead and go look at a merge request that's not merged. We have one open one called GitLab CI that I've already created. And what's cool about GitLab CI is that literally all I had to do was create this file, push it, and all of a sudden it starts testing, it being GitLab CI's process. You can see this pipeline here. This pipeline was kicked off when this branch was pushed. Now there's a lot of uh, triggers that you can set up on when you want to test things, and we'll talk about that later. But for now, let's just uh, open this pipeline here and check it out. So you can see this is what a pipeline looks like. It's showing failed overall, and we'll get into that in a minute. But basically what you see here are the two stages, build and run, and the two jobs associated with those stages. Now they're categorized this way because a stage can have multiple jobs in it that run in parallel. So if you had nominal run and three other runs, you could actually set up other runs and they'd all run in parallel. So let's go ahead and click on the build code. We see the green check mark. That means that it passed. And here we can actually see the exact output of what was run. Now remember, this is exactly identical to what happens when we type make. And 
the key here that I want to point out on these tests is that the return code is important so it shows job succeeded well how does GitLab know that it succeeded the answer is it knows because of the return code of the process so for example the return code is zero that means what was executed uh, did not execute with failure so in this case we're using make and the make process and is the, the bottom line is essentially that whatever return code comes out of your uh, your script line in your YAML file so you see these script lines if anything comes out of here with a non-zero return code it'll basically fail it by default now there's ways around that we'll talk about that later but the point is this is the output you can see it directly in GitLab CI for your merge request so you remember this job was triggered as part of the merge request uh, where we introduced this file now let's go over and look at the nominal run case you can see that uh, the run part which is basically dot slash hello let's run the run the binary it failed now it says no such file or directory and I set this up on purpose because I want to show you this was one of the first things that bit me when I was learning GitLab CI and it's an excuse to talk about artifacts so the way GitLab CI works job to job let me go back here when this job completes this job under the hood does not necessarily run in the same workspace now when I say workspace I mean somewhere under the hood there is a repo on disk that is the hello repo and under the hood obviously it did a make first well the second thing that it needs to do is run hello but as you can see it said there was no such file or directory and that's because the GitLab CI architecture is defined to be scalable purposefully in that this does not necessarily run in the same workspace as this which requires the user to define all the outputs coming from this job that are required to run for this job now in this case that's just the hello binary for example all you need is this binary to exist for your test to work now what we need to do to make this work is to tell this job essentially to archive the artifact the binary called hello so that it gets collected and moved to the workspace in which this job runs and the way you do that is by saying artifacts okay so I went, a, I went ahead here and uh, found the documentation because I couldn't remember the exact YAML syntax of how to do artifacts this is essentially it so what we need to do is go ahead and define artifacts colon and then paths and then uh, the path that we need in our particular project which will look something like this let's just go ahead and copy paste this and get rid of the old one I was trying to do from memory and did incorrectly uh, get my indentation on point here yeah okay so in our case we just want to collect uh, the path hello all right okay so we write the file get status shows that we have a change let's go ahead and add that and get commit oh binary man if I could type what's going on with me okay here we go now let's go ahead and push this branch so that that change gets updated in origin okay push complete it shows it's associated with a merge request let's go ahead and flip over there and check out our merge request again let's go back to that here we go right now and what we've got here it says pipeline pending So um, this job is in a pending state. So <laughs> here's what's going on here. GitLab.com provides these uh, these runners on the back end, picked by a runner, as you see. Um, they're free 
for these open source projects. I'm using GitLab.com on purpose. You can see it just got kicked off right here. Uh, but it was pending. It was waiting for a runner. These runners are shared by other projects across GitLab.com. And this might be a good time to point out that these runners, um, you can, they're open source and you can create your own runners in your own lab or on your own machine or however you want to deploy it. You don't have to just use GitLab.com's open source runners. Um, and we're not going to get into the details of how they work on the back end, but essentially they're using a Docker container to spawn off a Linux um, system under the hood and then it executes whatever you tell it to execute. So you can see the console updates as the run is happening. It executed the make, everything was fine, and we notice here that this is different, uploading artifacts. So it found the hello binary we told it to find. If we go back to the merge request page, we can now see that the first stage has passed, the second stage is in progress, the running. So this failed before, remember? So let's go ahead and look at the output on this guy. Now you can see that this Docker container may be running in a totally different area, but that's okay because under the hood, GitLab has absorbed the hello binary, essentially uploaded it from the first job, and is now downloading it into the second job. So we'll wait for this to complete. And here we go. So this is the output that we would see if we ran it locally. It ran hello, job succeeded, which means hello returned zero. Okay. So I want to point something out here. One more thing. These artifacts, they're not just a way to define what gets collected and downloaded into the next stage of jobs. It's also a mechanism by which you can see um, but you can see the the output directly in the browser. So let's go to the first job again. We'll notice there's a section over here called job artifacts and you can hit this download button and what do you know this is a zip file that's going to contain you guessed it the hello binary. So that's pretty cool that means that anyone can go to any merge request see the status of the tip of their branch whether it's passing or failing any tests and actually look at the outputs without them having to check out the branch, build and run themselves. This is especially useful if you're trying to, uh, to keep your software product stable across various build platforms. For example, I'm running on Ubuntu right now, but if you were to support Windows and three other flavors of Linux and Mac, well, you can't necessarily check out to a branch on a platform that you don't support locally, but this way you can test all of it and essentially you require that the content remains stable before you hit this merge button. Okay, so we can see here that we have a green check mark. That means our pipeline passed. That means, just to be clear, and I already mentioned this, but this next part is important. What we have tested here, or what GitLab CI has tested, is the state of the tip of the source branch of this merge request, which means this commit. 3900. Zero, zero. So we tested that state. Now, if you're a Git connoisseur, you may be asking the question, what happens when you click this button? Well, if you're familiar with GitLab.com, this creates a brand new commit, a merge commit that has potentially two, actually it always has two parents, depending on how you've set up your GitLab project. But the point being, when you click this button, you have created a new merge commit that technically may contain uh, a different code state than this commit because you've merged with the latest state of whatever your target branch is, in this case, master. So the point is, when I hit this merge button, the content gets merged into the master branch. But in, more importantly, the way this is set up by default, if you go over and look at pipelines, you will see that that action actually kicked off a new test, the test of the merged state. And you can see that it's pending. And so it's gonna perform the exact same test again on the merged state of that branch. And that's important, especially because, you know, in this case, I'm the only person uh, creating a merge request, but the master branch could have 10 merge requests that also get accepted. Uh, it, in between the time period of I'm testing. So you want to be testing the tip of the source branch, which was done here, and the final merged state. Because if this were to fail, you want to be able to back that out. Because the whole point of doing this is to keep your integration branch, the master branch in this case, stable throughout all time. 
Okay, I think that's a pretty good introduction for a hands-on kind of thing. Uh, there's a couple things that I just want to mention before we wrap up this video. I don't want it to be too long, but um, I just want to go over a couple top-level points of why continuous integration and testing is important. So here it's basically, I'm just saying that, and I can't emphasize this enough, that continuous testing, if you can set it up through a, a mechanism like GitLab CI or Jenkins, is immensely powerful. It will change the way that you build software uh, for the better because, because of these main points. You no longer have to trust the human to test everything. In some cases, it, it could be developer laziness. Oh, I forgot to test my stuff and I accidentally broke the master branch and then all your other developers have broken content and need to manage a cherry pick of some kind. If you set it up in this way, it is impossible for the master branch in this particular case to actually be unstable. And that saves time across the team multiplied by however many people are in your team. Also an important point on this, and GitLab has actually pioneered this idea of the YAML file and Jenkins, which is another CI platform has followed suit, which is that what gets tested is tracked in Git. That's super important because the, the YAML file itself is a file tracked in Git. That, that file defines the tests and jobs and all the stages and all the complexities of what you need to test. But the point is when a developer adds a new capability, they can simultaneously add a new test of that capability in the YAML file. What that means is that different merge requests can actually be testing different criteria, which is super powerful. And in a tool that is like uh, Hudson or Jenkins in the old style, uh, what gets tested is actually defined in the web browser of the tool itself, which means if you need to add a test, you need to coordinate it with whoever is responsible for uh, defining those tests. But no more. When we, when we have this GitLab CI YAML file, it's all tracked in Git. Every developer could update this potentially and therefore update in, uh, the definition of what gets tested. So all of this means that the Git history is stable in some minimal criteria. And by minimal, I mean the testing that's defined in your YAML file. There may be testing that you don't want to add to this, like say you have a test that takes eight hours or something and it's just not practical. But you can essentially define a minimal criteria for which all Git history is stable. This means errors can't be introduced into the integration branch at all. It's impossible. Also, it means that you can bisect the tree far easier if you need to uh, identify where something was introduced in the history. Um, if you're interested in Git Bisect, check out my Git Bisect video. I won't talk too much more about that. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was some of the other options. There, this video would be three hours long if I went through everything, and I'm still learning, so I'm not an expert in everything. But the things I've been exposed to are you can define in your job whether you prefer to fetch or clone. The difference being a fresh clone every time a job is kicked off or reusing a workspace if it exists by doing a, a git fetch. This makes a lot of sense if your project takes a long time to clone. Uh, obviously you don't want to waste like 15 minutes every time you want to test if most of that time is just coming from the clone itself. Jobs can be optionally labeled allow failure. This means that you can have a job that you want to run but you don't want to block the pipeline if it were to fail. Uh, and you could think of various use cases for that. Maybe you don't care too much about compiler warnings, but you want to know they're there, uh, those types of things. Okay, so the merge request in the project, you can actually define how merge requests react to different pipeline criteria. For example, you could require that your project cannot have a merge request be accepted unless testing has passed, meaning you literally can't hit that merge request button unless you get a green check next to your merge request, which is super cool. And there's also an option that you can basically require that all commits be stable in the merge request to be accepted. Now remember, we just tested the head commit in our example, but let's say your source branch has 10 commits, you could require that all 10 of those commits be stable before the merge request is accepted. That is a way to ensure that literally every commit in the tree is stable in a minimal criteria. 
the last thing I want to mention is there's a variety of job triggers. Uh, the way it's set up by default is on a push to any branch, the testing gets kicked off, which is why we saw it happen automatically in this video. But you can also define a certain branch naming scheme. Let's say you only want to test branches that start with issue numbers or you only want to test the development branch. I mean, you have full control over what gets tested when. And there's even a concept of manual triggers, meaning no testing uh, starts until a human goes in to the merge request and presses the start testing button. Okay, I think I'm going to end it there. It's getting to be a long video. Uh, I hope you found it useful. GitLab CI will make your, your software development process much easier. I uh, highly recommend it, so check it out. I'm Dan, the Get School Dude, and I'll see you guys next time.